I read the uh, broadcasting magazines and uh, uh, they, they re wrote several stories about uh, home box office and they planned to go on, on, tel on, on the satellite with their uh, pay movie service and uh, try and get cable systems to sign up. And it required a large receiver, everybody thought at the time, it cost close to $100,000. And uh, that was gonna really restrict the number of cable systems that were going to uh, be able to afford a satellite dish. But very quickly, uh, we learned that you could get by with a smaller, smaller dishes than, than that. And, uh, the technology changed and started evolving very rapidly. It really had ever since television had gotten started or since the Industrial Revolution. Technology uh, has moved generally faster and faster in, in certain areas where technology is important. There are certain things like growing radishes that technology hasn't really changed very much. But uh, television was, was uh, I feel like it was a pretty high tech business, uh, certainly it was in the early days of television. And I just kept up with uh, what was going on technologically and took, took advantage of, uh, of the new equipment uh, and new ways of doing things from, uh, from the very beginning. That's in, in business or in life or in uh, military engagements, uh, which I'd studied a lot, you know, that's old saying, is, get their firstest with the mostest and so forth. Uh, and, uh, and that's what I, what I tried to do in business. And I did because the record speaks for itself. I started with virtually nothing. It, it, in 1970, which was my first year in the television business, we had 35 employees at, at the station in Atlanta. And uh, we did $600,000 in business and 35 employees. And when I merged with Time Warner in 1995, which was 25 years later, we had 12,000 employees and we did two and a half billion dollars. And instead of losing a million dollars, which we did the first year, we made, made close to $250 million profit. So, and that was in 25 years. It was probably crazy. It was to take a local station, put it on the satellite, and and there were there were there were regulations against it, uh, but they changed the regulations. Uh, and I was doing some, I started lobbying. A, a lot of the battle that we fought in the television business uh, were fought to a large degree in Washington against the networks, the broadcasters, against the motion picture studios, uh, and against the sports leagues that didn't want uh, didn't want us to take our little station and take the programming and, and run it all over the country and basically uh, create a national network that was based on local programming. But uh, we were able to convince Congress uh, that, uh, that it would be good for, the, good for business because it would create competition to the three networks where there was none before. We were running movies and uh, and stripping situation comedies like uh, Andy Griffiths and Green Acres. You know, off network. We had off network stuff, and and, and very quickly we uh, I, I I I got the Braves baseball. So we had baseball games on where very few uh, markets, only the biggest markets that had uh, local baseball teams, uh, had local coverage. There, there wasn't, for most of America, only got the Saturday afternoon game on NBC, and all of a sudden, here was the, a complete slate of 150 baseball games, uh, most of them in prime time. So people in Nebraska and uh, North Dakota and South Dakota, Hawaii and Alaska could uh, have a team to cheer for that they never had before. No, it was uh, good programming and... and uh, we carried wrestling and people like that, and wrestling, baseball, basketball, and, uh, and movies and, and some other sporting events that we could get our hands on. We, uh, we had a very, very viable, popular uh, network there. Nielsen wouldn't give us the ratings for several years. I had to threaten to sue him. 
to, to rate us. They, so we didn't even have ratings and uh, we didn't show up in the rating books because we didn't meet the minimum requirements. But the only way I could tell what our audience was is, is the things that we sold on the air. We, we didn't have hardly any commercials, regular commercials like Procter & Gamble or Budweiser or Coca-Cola. They, they didn't buy us because we weren't, uh, to the most, for the most part, they wouldn't buy us because we didn't have ratings and we were too small. So, but we did, we, we were able to sell records and tapes uh, and crazy glue and things like, uh, like that. And people would mail, usually they'd mail their, a check for 1995 in, plus shipping and handling. And what I would do is to see where they came from. And I would separate the letters. The letters from Atlanta would go here. And the letters from outside of Atlanta would go over here. And the, the pile, you know, if I got 100 letters in Atlanta and I got 200 outside of Atlanta, I figured the audience was twice as big outside of Atlanta as it was inside of Atlanta. And while I was going through these letters, I swear to God this is the truth, it turns out that about one out of ten letters, the post office department was real sloppy, and they wouldn't stamp them, you know, that the, it was a used postage stamp. So I would tear those postage stamps off, and we'd use them again on our outgoing mail to save money. The chairman of the board was up there while <laughs> pulling the stamps off the, off the, uh, off the letters. And that, that, that's a funny story, isn't it? And for 20 years, I lived in my office. I lived in my office. I, I lived on a couch in my office for 10 years, and then luckily I got, uh, I, I, I got wealthy enough to build a little penthouse on the roof, so 700 square feet, and I, I moved up there. It was a lot nicer. Well, I just walked up the stairs one floor because my office was on the top floor, and I just walked up to go to bed. And that way I didn't have, I had another hour, hour to work every day because I would, when I walked downstairs, I was instantly in my office without having to uh, fight traffic. So I, I was able to, to work an hour. And I, you know, I, I went to the games uh, at night and I'd get home at 11. I'd come back in the office and I was right there at 7 o'clock when I woke up to be at work at 8. And I worked 18 hours a day, seven days a week. I liked it. I mean, almost. I'd, sometimes I'd go home, see my wife and family. But, uh, you know, I, I, I just, and I still live in my office. I live in my, up, up above in a penthouse over my office building in Atlanta and a restaurant's down on the ground floor. So if I'm hungry, I just go down to the restaurant and, and eat and get, get a meal and then go back up and uh, I'm right there. Well, I, I just thought before I even had the Superstation on the satellite, I was thinking cable was brand new and, and mainly it was just it only had technically only 12 channels uh, and you know four of them or five would be broadcast stations and they'd bring in other broadcast stations with a tall antenna but it didn't have except for HBO it didn't have any other programming until WTBS came along and, and while I was sitting there but but I could read I read all the magazines and it said cable was going to get more channels they were going to go from 12 channels to 30 channels that they basically could have unlimited channels eventually. And I said, well, if there's going to be, this was, this was in the late 60s, if there's going to be, because it was, um, well, no, it was, I'm sorry, the middle 70s, I, because I bought the station in January of 1970, merged with it, and we didn't go on the satellite till 1976. So this was 75. Uh, I said, what would be, uh, something else that people would would want to see, and I thought about I thought about uh, uh, a full time sports channel. But I said, nah, full time sports channel all during the day. They what would they run during the daytime? They could run reruns of games, but who really wants to see reruns of a game that took place two years ago? I so I thought, and that ESPN filled that notch niche, but they were several years later. So that I said that won't work. I said obviously a movie station will work twenty four hours a day. And HBO was already planning to go up there, and they went up about a year before, before we did. The Superstation was the second channel to go on the satellite after, after HBO. I said, 24-hour movies, that'll, that'll clearly uh, work. And I, and I thought, I said, you know, 24-hour news would work too. That, that would probably be the next 
channel because we only had the news for a couple hours a day then. The CBS Morning News and Today Show ran for two hours from 7 to 9. And then the next network newscast was until 7 o'clock at night. It was only 30 minutes long. And then there was a local newscast at 11. And I never got home till 8 o'clock or after. And I always went to bed at 10. There was no 10 o'clock newscast because there were no independent stations hardly. Uh, maybe there wasn't one in New York or something, but the, not they weren't widespread, New York and L.A. But uh, so we didn't have a 10 o'clock newscast, not even a local newscast. We had nothing. No, so I, I, I never saw television. Uh, I never saw television news except sometimes a few minutes in the morning. And I, I thought, boy, wouldn't it be nice for all the other people, you know, that uh, that get home late at night? Uh, but because I was learning, we were... T TBS was the first 24-hour, seven-day-a-week channel, the first channel that ever went 24-7. And the idea with that was that we were we had mostly old black-and-white movies and black-and-white series and a time when uh, when all the television programs and new programs were all in color. And uh, so w w we weren't exactly in a position to be the first channel you turned on. You know, we, we didn't have The Tonight Show or anything like that. So I said, but, but one thing we could do is if we were on all night, seven days a week, there are some people that have insomnia and when they get up and click around to, for something to watch, we'll be the only thing on. And what'll happen is if they watch a movie, you know, during the night, they'll turn the TV set off and when they turn the set back on in the morning, it'll be on channel 17. And uh, maybe they'll watch us in the morning. 24-hour news, it was a, I, I, I didn't think it was a, I thought it was a, a no-brainer. Uh, it was something you could, you could afford to do. It really doesn't cost that much more to do 24 hours of news than it does two and a half hours of news. You've got to have the news gathering organization. You have to have basically the same stories. But you need more stories and more different kinds of programs if you're going to do 24-hour news, unless you're going to do something like headline news, which... Is basically a half-hour rolling format that uh, uh, you tune in and out of. You don't expect somebody to stay with it more than a half an hour. But if you want people to have an opportunity to watch for extended periods of time, you need programs like Larry King Live and debate programs like what used to be Crossfire. You need financial reporting. You need you need uh, uh, extended uh, sports reporting. If you, if, you know if you're going to do do a good job, basically as a a number of cable news networks now, but we were the only one at the beginning. And it was, I didn't think it was hard to figure out uh, how it should be formatted uh, and what it should do. The main thing it was going to provide is uh, uh, news availability when people had a chance to watch it rather than when the networks, uh, when the networks wanted people to watch it. There was no question in my mind. Now, the only question was, would I run out of resources before it turned the corner? And there was no way I could know if it, about that until I went ahead and did it because I didn't have enough capital to see it through. But uh, in my study of history, uh, Erwin Rommel in the desert never had enough petrol to, for his offensives against the British to finish them. He had to depend on capturing uh, fuel supplies uh, from the British by attacking so quickly and uh, catching them off guard that they would uh, retreat and leave the leave some petrol for him to finish that it was it was dicey and it didn't always work but uh, I knew that was what I was going to have to do I was going to have to hit hard and move incredibly fast and that's what we did move so fast that uh, that the networks wouldn't have time to respond because they should have done this, not me, but they didn't have any imagination or didn't have adequate imagination. You had to get the story, and videotape had pretty much replaced film already, and it was instantaneous, so you had to get the tape to the closest uh, transmission point, whether it was telephone lines or uh, satellite. We, we tried to use satellite, but we didn't always use satellite uh, at the very beginning because it wasn't always available. So we used whatever method we could. If we had to do, we'd put the tape on a plane and fly it back to the closest place where we could transmit from.
it was one of the most exciting moments of my life. I knew what was coming. We, we knew that the attack was coming imminently because we'd been warned by the State Department and even the president called uh, the president network and, and strongly recommended that we get our people out of Baghdad. But I made the decision that as long as they would volunteer to stay, that they could stay. We were going to, freedom of the press, we were going to get the story. And um, I was in Jane Fonda's room. She was working, and I was uh, at the, the afternoon off. And it was, uh, I don't know, about 5 or 6 o'clock East Coast time and 2 o'clock West Coast. And I was watching CNN, and the war started. And I flipped over to uh, W. Well, KCBS, and they had uh, Dan Rather was in the studio talking, and I flipped over to uh, NBC, and Tom Brokaw was in the studio talking, and I flipped over to ABC, and Peter Jennings was in the studio talking, and I flipped over to CNN, and then the tracer bullets were going, and the rockets were getting shot down, and I said, yippee. I said, this is the greatest scoop in the history of journalism. And it still is the greatest scoop. And one network had the start of a war from behind enemy lines. That was just, but we were, the Iraqis didn't see us as enemies because we had already started the World Report. We'd had their, their chief executives had been over to Atlanta. They were hooked in and affiliated with us uh, on stories from Iraq. And they got a lot of stories from us to run in their local Iraqi newscast. So when we'd done this all over the world, so I built up a system, you know, ABC, NBC, and CBS, they come into these countries once in a while, when they, but we were there all the time. We were there all the time, and we had uh, material that they wanted, because anytime the Pope said anything important, we ran it. Anytime the President of the Soviet Union said anything, we had it. So if, if they just had a satellite dish at, at their network in Baghdad or wherever it was, Tokyo, and, and they had made arrangements with us. Uh, when I first got to Japan, I went around to the Japanese broadcasters and I said, CNN for not many yen. <laughs> I sold it there, sold it everywhere. With news, the, the more local you are, the more interest there is. People are more interested in their neighborhood than the other side of the world. And, and they're more interested in their district and their city and their state and their country than they are the other side of the world. But there are a number of people that are interested in what, you don't have to appeal to everybody. And in fact, nowadays with 100 channels on cable TV, you can see anything you want to basically. And uh, so it's become a medium of choice rather than a medium where you just sit there with a mass audience, sit there and watches uh, Milton Berle or Johnny Carson. It's uh, and, and, and I helped uh, make that happen. I helped set people free. You have to have a lot of courage and you have to have a lot of imagination because you have to figure out what you're gonna do from scratch. I mean, you could, you know, you can do a lot of things from scratch that aren't gonna work out. And I can best tell you how I did it. Uh, I, I spent a lot of time thinking I had done a lot of reading, and uh, when I had spare time, a lot of times I would just think and, uh, uh, and not waste my time watching TV. I, did, I watched very little television growing up, hardly any at all, and, uh, because I, I, I thought, and, 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 and your mind is just like uh, any other muscle in your body. If you want to have a sharp mind, you need to use it. You know, just like if you want to have strong muscles, you better work out a lot. And so I worked my mind out all the time. And, uh, and then when I needed it, I, I would put it to, uh, to use, uh, like developing CNN. I mean, I, for instance, uh, I, I asked myself, where are the threats going to come? Once CNN is on the air and people see it's going to be successful, where is the next threat going to come from? And I said, the, the next threat that the threat's going to come from a right-wing news network. And it was 18 years later before Fox got started. 18 years we had that. And by then I was making so much money and doing so well because I was going to take my point. The way I was going to counteract Fox was I had two 
networks, CNN and, and, and uh, Headline News. And uh, I could say, well, I'll just turn Headline News into a, the rightest wing network you ever saw and preempt Fox, and there would be no real reason for people to tune into it. And, but the when the time came and Fox got started, I was so successful, I was worth billions, where I'd been worth nothing at the beginning. And I just, uh, I, I, I like being straightforward with the news and something with my name on it. I, I, I couldn't do a right-wing network. And I said, they can just have whatever, what, whatever they want with it. And we'll, we'll stick, stick to uh, what, what we've been doing, being the world's most respected news network, like the New York Times. The New York Times doesn't try and uh, mimic the Post, not really. They, they stand there and, you know, and I, I give them credit. I wanted to be the New York Times of the television news business. I think CNN still, when they're at their best and when they're doing serious journalism, they're, uh, they're hard to beat, but they've definitely responded to the, to the ratings uh, and, and uh, taken, taken the network a lot of the time, and particularly headline news. I mean, if you watch headline news, to me, headline news in prime time now with Glenn Beck and uh, I, I, I never watch it. I just can't, can't watch it. It's just opinions. It's just blah, 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 blah. But Larry King's still there, pretty much doing the same thing, and uh, there's a lot about CNN. And, and, and Headline News in the morning hasn't been, they, they haven't changed the format much on it. They've gone a, a little more tabloid. Uh, but then, you know, whenever you sell or merge your company, and I, you know, I made a mistake doing it. That, the, the mistake I made was uh, losing control of the company, but I didn't, I didn't plan for that. I just, everything went wrong. Uh, but in a way, that was good, too, because I'd had so much success for so long, and uh, I, I, I didn't get the big head, though, I, 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 but, but I did perhaps uh, overestimate uh, just how much strength that I would have with the Time Warner merger. As long as, as, long as it was just Time Warner, I had uh, 7 or 8% of the company when, when I merged with Time Warner, but when we merged with AOL, I went down to 3%, and that's when they phased me out. I got laid off in a restructuring. But that's okay. I got in the restaurant business. I'd always wanted to do that, and I'm enjoying, uh, enjoying that. And if I had still had my job at Turner Broadcasting, I, would have, uh, I, I wouldn't have I would have gotten into the philanthropy to the extent that I have, probably, not as early as I did. And uh, I'm, that's been very, very satisfying. You want to have a good positive attitude. If something happens to you that uh, breaks your heart, uh, that's not going to do you or anybody any good. What you've got to do is shake it off. And, uh, and just like in, if, you, if you're playing for a baseball team, you know, you, you get beat on Friday. Well, you know, you got Saturday and Sunday. And if you get beat on Saturday and Sunday, well, there's Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And if you get beat all year, like the Braves, the first four years I owned them, they came in last every time in, in their division and set a record. For, that is, stands today with the most consecutive last place finishes when, since divisional play was started. But I didn't quit. And uh, 18 years later, I won the World Series. So, you know, and we had the best team in the history of sports. For 13 consecutive years, we won our division. When I was about I, 10 years old, I went out. My father had a sailboat, and I went out with him. And then I started racing when I was 11 or 12, and, and uh, for 33 years, it was very important to me. And I raced in thousands of races and won hundreds of them. It takes the same things it takes to be great at anything. First of all, you have to have some ability, uh, and then you have to work real hard. And uh, that's what I did. I, I had some ability, not a great amount. In the first eight years that I raced sailboats, I never won. I was sailing at the Savannah Yacht Club in Savannah, Georgia, and I never won the club championship. I was second almost all the time, but I never won once in eight years. And then in my ninth year of racing, I went to college and started racing there. And all the work that I'd done, because while I, 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 I those first eight years, I said I wasn't really losing. I was learning how to win. 
And then I just, uh, from then on, from uh, my first year in college, I won just about all the time. Not all the time, but I won way more than my normal share of the races. I was named Yachtsman of the Year four times. No man has ever done that before, and, 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 or since. It's like the MVP, they have a, an award that the yachting writers uh, select. And they were, they were all in the 70s, but uh, that was when I was on, really on top. I would say it started with my, uh, it started with my father, and then uh, he always said, "Son, you got to work hard and be a big success." And uh, and when I got to school, that's what they told me in school. I went to military school, uh, boarding school for a number of years, and that's what they said. And uh, so all I did really was do what I was told: work hard and be a big success. I was a pretty good student. I was a uh, B plus student for the most part. I would say I never, I never quite got straight A's, but one, one period I got three A's and a B. That was the best I ever did. At, at boarding school, we had a required study hall, and um, I, I was usually able to get my homework done in less than a two and a half hours, and I read the rest of the time. And, and but I did some reading just for. Uh, uh, for information on my own, but mostly when I didn't have to, I was outdoors uh, doing things. I was always doing things rather than reading about them, but, I, but I've read a lot in my life. When I was young, mainly I read uh, history. I was fascinated by history, and I read a lot about uh, animals and birds. I was fascinated by nature, but I, but I really uh, was interested in lots of things. I was interested in in movies and uh, somewhat in sports, and I, I was, I I was interested in just about uh, in just about everything. When I studied history, I was perhaps most fascinated by military history, and uh, the, the growing up in the South and 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 having moved down from the North, uh, the Civil War was all all around us, and uh, I went to school for six years in Chattanooga, Tennessee on Missionary Ridge where one of the great battles was, uh, was fought, so there were monuments all around. And, and so I would say that uh, World War II, and, and uh, because my father fought in that, and I was alive when it's, when, uh, during it, as, even though I was a young boy, I remember it uh, vividly. <clears throat> and, um, but the Civil War, the Civil War probably, uh, uh, drew my interest a little bit more than some of the others. When I got to college, I, I was a classics major, and uh, that was mainly the study of, of Greek, uh, Greek and to a lesser extent Roman history and culture, and uh, that, that fascinated me, the Iliad, the Odyssey, uh, the Aeneid, uh, Virgil, and uh, I, I, I enjoyed uh, Gone with the Wind, and, and, and uh, history books, like I, as I said, of, of all types. I was fascinated by naval history, uh, and I ended up, you know, spending a good bit of my time racing, racing sailboats, and when I did that, I fancied myself uh, a modern Horatio Nelson. I would have rather been able to play but, uh, you know, I, I was working a 42-hour week um, when I was 12 years old in the summer. I'd come home from school, military school, and, and uh, i get a week off at the beginning of the summer and a week off at the end of the summer, and the rest of the time I had to work. And I think he started out paying me 10 cents an hour. It was below the minimum wage. I remember it was 85 cents an hour. And, and I, I said, Dad, it, first of all, I'm too young to be employed. You know, I think you had to be like 15 or something before you could be legally employed. I said, and, and I said, you're paying me below the minimum wage. I said, I've got, he said, well, what are you going to do about it? I said, well, I could turn you in. I said, but I better not. What good would that do? So I just did what he said. I wasn't in sales to start with. I, I started as a bill poster and uh, on constructing billboards and painting them and maintaining 
maintaining the billboards. I did that for about five years. And then when I got to be 17, about 17 years old, I, I, I put on a coat and tie and went out and, uh, and went, went with our sales manager to learn, learn sales. Brown's in the Ivy League. My dad wanted me to uh, go to an Ivy League school if I could get in. I wanted to go to Harvard, but I didn't get in. And uh, so I went to Brown. I did get in there. Brown was a liberal arts school. He, I think by then he, he wanted, wished I'd gone to business school, but I didn't. I went to, uh, I, chose, I chose to go to Brown, and he let me make that choice. Uh, and then he wasn't ha particularly happy with it when he realized that uh, like the economics courses, and I took several of them, they were all theoretical. They weren't uh, practical business. It wasn't a business school. And uh, so whatever I majored in there, whether it was English literature or whatever, I don't think he'd have been, been happy with. He wanted me to uh, be successful in business, and I think he would have been, I know he would have been happier if I would, had been attending business school. I didn't get actually kicked out, and I'm a graduate from there. I was, I was suspended. That's what they called it. I was suspended a couple of times. The first time I, I got back in right away, and the second time uh, I uh, decided not to, to finish college at that point and went on and went into uh, the business with him. He still wanted me to do that. The second time, the second time I got suspended, it was for having a girl in, in my room. Well, in those days, that was against the rules, but I didn't have any, any money, so I couldn't go uh, rent a hotel room or motel room. And, uh, you know, I, I, but I, I was breaking the rules, and I, I knew I was, but that's just the way it, way it went. It was hard to lose uh, my sister, and then a couple of years later, uh, my father too. Um, but w the way that uh, if if I had have spent my time just sitting down and thinking about it, it would have absolutely crushed me. And I did give it some thought, obviously. But in both cases, uh, whenever I had tragedy occur. In my life, I, I just go work harder and try, and I, I think that's the best way to uh, to heal from wounds is to uh, spiritual wounds, wounds of the heart. Is the best thing to do is 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 get your mind off of it as quickly as you can, and uh, and and the best way to do that is do something you know that uh, re requires uh, your thought process and and your efforts so that you. Uh, can do something else and, and concentrate on it, and uh, and, and grow grow out of the uh, out of the tragedy. My father just had he had a classic case in those days. They didn't. Uh, I don't believe that they diagnosed uh, clinical depression, but I, I think he had uh, the clinical depression primarily, and and he had uh, up and down mood swings that could have been a a bipolar situation. Uh, we know so much more about psychiatry today than we did than we did 50 years ago. Uh, but I never really went back and tried to study what it was. It whatever it was, it was uh, that was unpleasant. Very shortly a after his funeral, a couple of days later, you know, they probated the will, and uh, he had left me as uh, executor, even though I was only 24 years old. And uh, I, I basically had control of his little billboard company and the responsibility for uh, meeting the uh, other, the other uh, instructions in his will. Dad and I were very close. And uh, he was my best man at my first wedding. And we were we were we were we were very close, and and I did have a desire to uh, show the world that uh, that that he had a viable good business, and that uh, that it was going to be successful, and we did that.
He had expanded the company dramatically, taken on a lot of debt, and, and tripled the size of the company with, uh, with the acquisition of, uh, of part of uh, the, the biggest billboard company in America. He got a, a small p a piece of it, but it, was, it, it catapulted us uh, uh, size-wise up several uh, notches. And, uh, but, but there was a, a lot of debt associated with it. He was concerned unnecessarily so about the level of debt and was afraid he wasn't going to be able to make the payments and he was going to be like his father and lose everything and which he, he wouldn't have done but but he was uh, uh, he had he had been an alcoholic and a chain smoker too and just about the time he made this uh, this acquisition he also uh, uh, quit smoking and drinking at the same time which was a traumatic uh, situation for him and I think that that uh, helped to, to push him to the edge of wherever he, wherever he was. He also had health problems too. He, he had smoked three packs of cigarettes a day his whole adult life and uh, he had developed emphysema a year or so before and he was having a real hard time breathing. It's ter emphysema is terrible and uh, smoking is terrible. Drinking to excess is terrible. I mean, I've, uh, you know, I learned a lot of things from my father and from others, and one of them was to drink moderately and don't smoke. <laughs> that was, has been helpful to me, I'm sure. I uh, got uh, some of the advertisers to, that were, that leased the billboards over uh, a year's period of time to prepay me for a discount and uh, I sold some stock to some of the employees so I'd, I'd already worked at the company for 12 years at different parts of it so I knew the billboard business inside and out when I was 24 years old. My father had explained uh, how it worked and to me so over the years and uh, I, I hit the ground running because I, I was already, I had the experience of most 40 year old people when I was 24. I'd had all the experience. I, I knew knew the business inside and out, and I'd worked hard at it and studied it. And I mean, it was uh, it was it was relatively easy. It was much simpler to understand. Basically, with billboards, you go out and lease the location. I mean, in those days, we tried to pay twenty five dollars a year, and uh, for the location, and then you put the billboard up, and then you went and rented it to a uh, advertiser for. $25 a month, and uh, you maintained it, kept making sure that the lights were burning at night, and uh, that the weeds were cut in front of it, and it was maintained, and, you know, and, and, and hopefully between your income and your outgo, if you could keep your signs leased most of the time, you'd make a profit. That's, that was it. It's not... Very simple. The television business was much more complicated because of satellite and cable TV that were brand new when I got into the into the business. No one had really had utilized them very much, hardly at all. Before I did that, I I, I went into radio. Actually, I bought five uh, bought and merged with five radio stations, and because I didn't have enough money to buy a television station at that that point, and I didn't even know what. UHF television was. We had in Atlanta four VHF stations, the commercial stations, and then this UHF station popped up somewhere, and I heard that it was about to go broke uh, because nobody could get UHF in those days. There was no cable TV except in small towns where, where they brought television to people that uh, lived too far from a big city to get uh, over-the-air television. But, uh, so it was, uh, I, I, at that time I figured that, that television was really uh, on the move and growing much faster because it was new. Uh, this was in the 60s. Television was relatively uh, new and color television was just started, really just starting too. And, uh, uh, I figured the television that nobody could see, I jokingly said, the television nobody could see would be easier to sell than billboards because nobody could see, or hardly anybody could see. And I went out and told the advertisers that 
our viewers were more intelligent than the network viewers, and they said, why? I said, because you have to be a genius to figure out how to get UHF. You know, so the people we have have were, had to be real smart to figure out how to get the special antenna and how to hook it up and twist it around so they could get, get a signal. That's pretty much true, too. They already were running some old movies, but I went, I, I put a little more emphasis on, on movies. I like them personally, and uh, even an old movie a lot of times had uh, great production value and actors and so forth because they were made for the theater, even though people had an opportunity to see the old movies when they were in the theaters, and uh, as opposed to the television shows uh, that premiered on television, you know, they were first run. But we couldn't afford first run shows. So uh, we, we, we ran a lot, of, a lot of movies. Because it needed it. That's where the biggest problems are is in the world, in the developing world. In the United States, we're so fortunate and most people don't even realize just how lucky we are unless, because the media in, in, in the country doesn't, I mean, you know, they'll run a few photographs of uh, Darfur, but you don't, we don't see the, uh, we don't see the suffering much anymore because the, the newscast, no, I, I know when we ran programs about the suffering in the third world, we could see the Nielsen meters turn. People didn't want to see it. So basically the networks don't run it anymore. Just like they hardly run news about what the casualties are in Iraq. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's unfortunate, I think, because uh, the world is so complicated, complex, and with nuclear weapons so dangerous uh, that we need to have a citizenry that's well informed. But you can't make people watch something that they don't want to watch or read something that they don't want to read. And uh, we get an awful lot of these serial killers and murderers, you know, here because people are bizarrely attracted to uh, bizarre behavior. And, uh, you know, the mother that, I mean, I just, uh, I mean, it's just depressing to me because I don't consider that news. I, I consider that sensationalism. I mean, I don't really need to know or want to know about some, you know, a sniper that kills six kids and then shoots himself. And today the story is about the guy that shot himself in the head three times before he killed himself. That's hard to do. You know, usually you only shoot yourself in the head once, uh, particularly if you aim carefully. He must have, he must have had bad aim. I was going to be honored as the man who did, you know, made the greatest contributions to UN that year in the United States. And I wanted to have something to uh, say, and I figured that on my way to New York, I was waiting to the last minute to work on my speech. I said, what are you gonna say, Turner? I said, well, why don't, because it, the US was about a billion dollars in arrears. We hadn't paid our debt for two years, and it was about a billion dollars. I said, well, why don't you just give a billion dollars to the UN and I'll just make up for what the U.S. didn't pay, you know, step forward. and Like if your uncle doesn't pay his bills down at the grocery store, you pay him for him. So that's what I decided to do. There's no way of knowing whether that's true or not. Uh, and, and it doesn't really it really matter, but the gi giving has uh, increased dramatically charitable giving in the United States. And I, I personally think that's good because we have so many people that have made just tons of money and you can't really spend billions of dollars intelligently on yourself, although people like Ari Ellison try. And he has, I think, spent over a billion dollars on himself. He's probably, you know, most of it. He's got a 500-foot yacht now that's bigger than an ocean liner. That's, supposed to have like a hundred people at work on it and he probably takes one couple out with him most of the time so there's four people being waited on by a hundred. It's kind of silly. I said we needed to have a list of, uh, of the biggest givers not just the richest people and Slate has done that and uh, I think For Fortune magazine and, 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 and it, I, it, it did help giving because a lot of these guys just want to be on a list somewhere. You know when I see their name in a magazine. <laughs> What's wrong with that? You know, most of us are that way.
most of us would like to be a movie star, even if we aren't, right? Who, wouldn't you rather be Paris Hilton? The well, Nuclear Threat Initiative uh, was uh, conceived of and, and created by Sam Nunn and I, who are the co-chairs of it, to, uh, to try and see if we can reduce or eliminate the threat from weapons of mass destruction, nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons. We, we want to see uh, humanity survive and not commit mass suicide, and uh, that's why, why we did it. And, why we're still working at it. That's the main reason why I started the Nuclear Threat Initiative, because instead of getting rid of the weapons, uh, we had, when India and Pakistan went nuclear, that was a real wake-up call. I had let myself get lulled into going to sleep over, because I'd worked with the Russians in trying to end the Cold War, and uh, the Soviets, I should say, and we came up with the Goodwill Games, and uh, I was right there when we when, when the Cold War came to an end. And I thought, you know, that now that we've made it through the Cuban Missile Crisis and the Berlin Wall Crisis and all the other crises, you know, that in a reasonably quick period of time, we'll get rid of the nuclear weapons and have a safer, better world. But it didn't happen, so that's why we started the initiative. So far, it hadn't happened. I still believe it will. Either we'll get rid of the weapons at some point or they're going to get rid of us. Remember the story that was in last week's news about the B-52 that took off from North Dakota with live uh, nuclear weapons on it by mistake. They loaded them. I mean, we're just so lucky. And, you know, they say they're safe, you know, but I don't believe it. I mean, you know, they say that airlines are safe, too, but every week one crashes somewhere in the uh, world. They're too busy playing uh, electronic games with their thumbs, which don't require any brain power. And uh, it really worries me that you know that we're getting we're getting only lucky to be getting half the news that we should be getting. Uh, and we're playing these dumb games that don't require that don't exercise our minds. So, you know, what do you expect? You know, if, if I mean, we, we elected George Bush as president of the United States twice, right? And he's struggling with the job. Let's, you know, it's Joe Torrey, even though he got eliminated yesterday, you know, has a better overall record. Nobody really wants to, wants to drop a nuclear bomb on, except nuts. And that's the frightening thing. There are some nuts out there. I mean, there's, a, there's more than one Osama bin Laden. And uh, if they ever get their hands on a nuclear weapon, it's goodbye New York, and maybe Washington if they get two. And if, it, if it's a Chestnian that gets it, it's goodbye Moscow. So, I mean, I, and, and, you know, killing 10 million people in five minutes, I mean, that seems, uh, it, it'll, you know, it'll be a real, a real tragedy. The next step is to keep working. Keep trucking along. I mean, it's, uh, it took a long time to get CNN to be profitable. It took me a long time with the Braves to get them to be uh, World Series winners. It took me a long time to win the America's Cup. I mean, a long time for a life, but I'm almost 70 now, and, uh, but I'm still working hard on the things that I consider most important. I want to see it a more equitable uh, world. I'd like to see the do our round of the trade talks uh, end successfully and the rich world cut the tariffs uh, on the poor world's farm, uh, farm exports so that uh, the poorest people in the world will have a chance to make a decent living. Uh, I'm a free trader. I believe in free trade. I think that, the, that, the, that, the, that even though it creates problems, it creates more uh, opportunities than it does problems, and it's better than having uh, all these, all these protectionist uh, devices. They don't, you know. It, it, I think it's free trade works better, even though it's not perfect. You're not gonna. There is no system that's going to be absolutely perfect. It'd be nice if there was, but there. I don't think there is. But, but we can come as close to it as possible. We can get 
get a lot further towards it, and we're better educated today than we ever have been before. Fifty years ago, half the people in the world were illiterate. Now it's only about 20 percent of the adults. We haven't talked about that, but I, I, I'm very uh, interested in what we, we've got to move away from fossil fuels as quickly as we can because we're uh, poisoning the atmosphere and uh, turning the world into a hothouse. Yesterday, across most of the East Coast, it was 10 degrees hotter than it's ever been. 10 degrees, not one degree. That's just gigantic. Uh, I was in Washington earlier today, and it was so hot you could barely go outside. Solar power will, wind power, uh, in certain instances, bio biofuels. Uh, perhaps we'll have to take another look at uh, nuclear nuclear power, but we've got to got to quit uh, burning up so much CO2, planting trees. We're going to have to do all those things, and I'm trying to do them as much as I can now. You better get out there and hustle because there's, uh, it's tough out there. It's, you know, there's a lot of other people trying to get to the top too. So you have to, if, if you're going to be an entrepreneur and if you want to be a success in life, you, you better be prepared to uh, work hard and, uh, and, and, and be smart and think, think a lot. And it, at least I think so, unless you're just a genius or uh, you just are tremendously lucky. There's a little saying that, uh, that I heard a long time ago. It said, uh, the secret of success is early to bed, early to rise, work like hell, and advertise. Well, I don't think it's really an American dream. I think it's a dream of everybody. I, as, as I said at the beginning, I, I was told uh, by my parents and society and by schools to work hard and be a big success, and that's what I did.